Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we're going to talk about cloud application security brokers, otherwise known as CASBs. And more specifically, we're going to do a little bit more of a deep dive on Microsoft Cloud App Security, or otherwise known as MCAS. This ties into our conditional access, this conversation, and modern management, and all the things that have affected our lives basically since COVID has started and people have started shifting from a more on-prem going to the office type work to a work from home or remote environment. I think CASB has become a a hotter topic in the post COVID age. It definitely was on the most talked about topic at the Gartner conference that I went to last fall. So it's very important, and it's probably one of those things that once you start to get to a certain maturity level, this is something that you want to definitely look at and deploy. And in fact, you may already own portions of MCAS, and you may not know it already. So we're going to dive into that as far as licensing goes and and how to deploy it, even in the limited fashion that you may already own, depending on what licensing model you have for Microsoft. So what is a CASB? Cloud access security brokers, they can be on-premise or cloud-based security policy enforcement points. And they're basically placed between the consumers or the customers and a cloud service provider. They act as like a man in the middle, if you will, where they interject enterprise security policies and our cloud as the cloud-based resources are accessed. So you have a bunch of SaaS apps today And when you try to access those SaaS apps from a location, depending on certain conditions, it could be based on a device condition. It could be based on an IP location. It could be based on your identity posture, all these different things. When you access that SaaS application, whether it is a third party one or Microsoft, you can interject these security policies to perform certain actions to enforce your policies on what data is being accessed. So there's a couple of architectural considerations when it comes to CASBs. They can be deployed in a lot of different fashions. For Microsoft, MCAS specifically, you can do log ingestion from firewalls, from secure web gateways, from SIMs. You can also push those alerts out to a SIM as well, something like Azure Sentinel. And then Memcast also has some cloud-to-cloud API connectors for a third party and within, obviously, the Microsoft suite. They have some native integrations. Also, one of the cool things that MCAS has is a way to reverse proxy connections from identity providers. Obviously, it integrates very well with Azure Active Directory, but also if you have a third-party identity provider, it can reverse proxy those connections from there, something like Okta that's actually built into MCAS, which is really cool. So you can have an Okta app that you single sign on through Okta, but you reverse proxy that connection through MCAS to enforce security policies as the user is accessing that SaaS app through Okta. What is really nice when it comes to reverse proxy, and I'm going to dive into reverse proxy versus forward proxy in a minute, but the way that MCAS does stuff, it doesn't require a client-side uh, agent on the machine. There are some CASB solutions that require an agent. 
And those are considered more forward proxies. So you put an agent on your machine, that agent will then forward your traffic to a proxy, the MCAS, or I'm sorry, the CASB solution. And they'll do the enforcement of the policies after the traffic has been forwarded from the client using the agent to the cloud. MCAS does something really cool because it's agentless, which means that it can work on a managed machine or on an unmanaged machine. As you're accessing that resource, it will reverse proxy back to MCAS and then perform the policies there. Adam, I know you have a lot of experience with MCAS. What is your spin on, on all of that? So I work in technical sales for Microsoft, which is something that comes up from time to time on this show. So MCAS is a product, Microsoft Cloud App Security, that I sell every day. And so it's interesting because I, I certainly try to keep an open mind and, and learn as much as I can about the broader space. And this is an interesting space in that it has matured very, very quickly. So CASB was like a buzzword four years ago, and now it's a really entrenched space where there's a lot of really, really good players like uh, Netscope and uh, Microsoft and McAfee and, and Cisco. There's, there's a lot of good um, CASB solutions out there. And I'd say one of the most interesting things about it that I spend a lot of time talking to customers about is exactly what Andy just went over, architecture. Because the architecture of all the different solutions can vary so broadly. Is it an on-premises appliance? Is it agent-based? Is it agent-less? And that's really important to understand as you evaluate the different solutions, because of course it's going to impact their capabilities. But as opposed to just focusing on that, I always like to point out, consider why those architectural decisions were made. Why did the vendor design the product the way they did? So I can tell you in the case of Microsoft, one of the reasons our product is designed the way it is, is because we hate agents. We are trying to rid the world of agents running on Windows endpoints as much as we possibly can. And so we don't want another agent installed on there and we want to leverage what's already in place. So there's integration you'll see as we go through today's conversation where we integrate with Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, which already is baked into the Windows 10 operating system. And so that's how, in particular, our solution can have some of that visibility uh, in scenarios where there might otherwise not be. And then one more point on that subject, and this is another point of discussion as we compare these different solutions, you'll notice that there's kind of a range of attitudes how different CASB solutions approach unsanctioned applications. So an unsanctioned application is an app that your organization does not officially use. So you can think of it as uh, maybe somebody's doing something in Google Workspace, like they're using Google Docs and Google Sheets to get some work done. There are some vendors that might promise you they give visibility into those behaviors. I know at Microsoft, that's not something we're interested in doing. We can give you information to say, Andy Jaw uploaded 257 megabytes to Google Workspace last week. However, we're not going to give visibility into that application. And so that's another architectural decision to kind of look at and understand as you do your evaluation and look at these different solutions is some of them will promise they can do that. And as a privacy advocate, and Andy, I know as you too, we both understand that there is not a presumption of privacy when you're on corporate owned devices or corporate assets. But at the same time, this opens the door of looking into business that really isn't yours, where maybe people are using their business asset, but they're trying to do something in their personal lives. And it's just, it's, it's a challenging situation because I understand both viewpoints, but I tend to err on the side of don't gather more data than you need. And so of course I, I do align with how our product is designed. But just kind of want to point that out because that does come up in conversation is you'll I'll, I'll have potential customers say, well, I, I want to be able to see what somebody's doing in this app that we don't sanction. And in Microsoft Cloud App Security, that's can't do that by design. And other vendors may say they can. So just something to understand as, as we kind of go through and, and pick apart some of the different capabilities. 
you may be asking yourself, why should I get a CASB solution? Why should I even care about this category of security products? So we're going to go through a couple of use cases of why a CASB can help you out. We're going to group them into four different major categories. So the first category is shadow IT. And there's a lot of shadow IT that happens in larger organizations where maybe one department will go out and purchase a SaaS app on a credit card or um, just go ahead and start connecting to different apps using their corporate credentials. And so that happens all the time. And using a CASB, you can discover all of the cloud apps that are being used in your organization. So one of the examples is using Microsoft Defender for Endpoint and that hooks in. And so every single application that is running on that machine that you go to will then populate within your discovered apps. There are other ways to do it too. In my organization, we don't use Defender for Endpoint. We have a different solution that natively works with MCAS as well um, called Zscaler. And they integrate and they populate all the apps just as Endpoint for Defender will. And so that's a great reason if you're not even sure what applications you may be using, you can use a cloud application security broker or MCAS to discover everything that's going on. I always describe this as table stakes when I talk about these class of products to customers and that discovery was kind of the first thing cloud access security brokers promised to do was give me visibility into what's the shadow IT situation in my organization. One of the challenges that has kind of come up today is a lot of these initially were designed around log ingestion which is taking your network logs that Andy talked about in architecture, ingest them, make sense of them, and spit out pretty dashboards. Unless you're not doing split tunneling which with your VPN, which you should change if you aren't, um, you probably don't have a whole lot of day-to-day -day traffic flowing over your corporate network right now. And so that's going to be of limited utility. And so that's where, depending on what solution you're looking at, find out what the other options are for off-network discovery. And that would be things like Andy talked about in the Microsoft world, integration with Zscaler or Defender for Endpoint. But does your solution provide an agent or is there a proxy everything flows through? Or is there an on-premises appliance that you route everything through? Whatever it may be, it's a really important thing to understand as, you know, and, 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 Andy and I don't really want to go down this path, but there's a lot of conversation around we're not putting the genie back in the bottle with work from home. And so while certainly I'm excited to go back in the office, and I know a lot of other people are too, there's going to be much more hybrid work in the future. So relying on corporate network to do anything like app discovery is probably a non-starter at this point. So it's important to understand the other options for doing that instead. The next use case is assessing the risk and compliance of your cloud apps. So one thing that these cloud app security brokers will do is once you discover all your apps, they will list your apps and they'll do a, essentially a profile on that particular application. So take Google Cloud Platform, for, for example, or Dropbox. If it's being discovered that it's being used in your environment, which means that a user has gone to that site and, and done something on it, a transaction, if you will, it will look up all the information. All of these cloud security brokers will have a profile of that particular application. Does it have valid SSL certificates? Does it have ISO 20, uh, 27001 certification? Is it HIPAA compliant? Does it follow GDPR practices? All these different compliances and security things that you may care about. And in the case of MCAS, it provides it with like a security score or risk score. And what's great about that is you can then create policies based on those risk scores to either alert you or even take action. So one of the things that I've done in my environment is as applications are being accessed from Zscaler and flows over to MCAS, I have a, a rule 
within MCAS that anything that is a risk score of two, one, or zero on a scale of 10, so going up to 10 with MCAS, so one, zero, or two, if it's discovered in my environment, I automatically unsanction it. And that flows into back into Zscaler, into a unallowed application category, which then blocks it. Sometimes there are some false positives. Maybe an app has been discovered that Microsoft doesn't have the right detail on, and that happens. You can just go back and sanction it. So that's, that's another use case. As you're discovering apps, you discover risky apps. I also really like it in the fact that by going to some of these applications, it's almost like if you browse to a website and it has malicious ads, those feed over to domains, which then show up also as applications that have been accessed. I've, I've seen news sites that are .ru that have shown up. And that's mainly not because the user has gone to the site, but probably as some sort of ad or some sort of feed, it has shown up. If I see those, I will block them. And that's almost like an, an easy way to prevent that app from ever getting used again in my environment. So that those are two different things that I like to do with CASB. I really like how Andy is calling out specific use cases that he has implemented in the real world because one of the challenges people run into when they start looking at these products is they go, okay, there's a lot of cool stuff here. What can I do with it? And that's where I think the the real challenge comes in is that uh, what do you do with this? Like what kind of things should you implement? What, what should be your strategy? And um, that's where having these really concrete examples is super duper helpful because now you know some of the things you can go do. And I might even add a little bit onto what Andy talked about with the risk scoring is you could not only do the overall risk score, you could do the individual attributes Andy talked about. So like, is it HIPAA compliant? You could say if any app is not HIPAA compliant, because we're a healthcare company, uh, generate an alert if there's been over 200 megabytes uploaded to it, or there's over 20 users using it or whatever. Um, so that could be valuable as well. And then one other thing to point out, as Andy was talking about through these cloud app catalogs with these attributes and risk scores and all that. And, and again, most vendors are going to have something analogous to this is understand where that data comes from. Because with some CASBs, it's going to be more crowdsourced, like a Wikipedia model, which is fine. I mean, Wikipedia is crowdsourced and it's great. Uh, or does it come from like a professional cloud analyst team? Uh, or is it attested directly from the individual SaaS providers? Just a useful thing to know and understand when you're looking at that data so you understand where did it come from and how trustworthy is it. Another use case that I've implemented that I really like for CASB solutions, specifically with MCAS, is you're able to discover OAuth apps that are being access, accessed in your environment. OAuth apps are often wide open. You know, By default, they are wide open in your M365 environment. There are other OAuths like for G Suite and Salesforce. And so as users connect their credentials, they, they grant these applications data from your environment. Recently, I made a switch, and this is a little bit outside of the CASB's discussion, but within Azure AD, you can control your OAuth to M365 as well. There was a new category that they implemented recently for, uh, I can't remember the exact terminology for it, but it's like verified applications. So there's like the wide open, you let anyone connect, and then there's the closed one where only admins can approve, and then now there's this new middle one where it's like verified applications through Microsoft. You'll you'll let them connect, and then anything that's not verified, you have to get approval. And that's a nice middle ground because Microsoft has a bunch of applications that they verified, and you don't need any admins to approve that, but then if it's outside of that, admins have to approve it. Fun side story, I had, we have these positions in our company called business analysts, which are really, really great. I think all businesses, once they get to a, a 
or maturity in IT that they should have these. They're basically people who are embedded in the business and they report on the business side, but they find out what technical needs the business needs and then funnels that through to IT to say, hey, the business needs a cloud sharing platform. Okay, what, what do you got? Do we own something? Do we need to buy something? And so she forwarded something to me and said, hey, I need to add this Teams add-in to for something that my, my group needs to use. I went and looked at the OAuth permissions for it because it wasn't a verified application. And when I looked at it, it was like gives full access to all the Teams, all the channels, all the data, full access to OneDrive files, full access to email, calendars. I mean, it was like the gamut of things. And I was like, mm, this is probably not something that I'm going to grant access to. Unless it's like a business critical application, right? This is not something that we're going to just let an application have all of this access to. With the OAuth connections to MCAS, you can also discover applications. It's a really nice screen that shows you which apps that are connected right now that have high privileges. So you can evaluate those. And you can also, I have a rule, a policy that if an app is discovered as malicious, so Microsoft has a threat feed that they continually analyze. And if they find an app that is malicious, they'll feed that through. And if that app becomes malicious, I have a policy to automatically revoke the access to that application. So that's another really great use case to give you insight on what is connecting and then also provide policies to enforce and revoke that access. This is a really important point that Andy's making because this was a threat vector that became really popular, I'd say, in the last six to nine months because once a user has granted OAuth permission to another application, it doesn't set off any warning alarms in your system anymore. It's granted access. So if you say, oh yeah, Mr. Application, you can have full rewrite access to my mailbox and all my calendars and contacts and to-dos and all that, then when that app comes and does that, it doesn't set off anything. It looks normal. It's doing what it's supposed to do. And this is definitely an area of opportunity to lock down your environment where it's probably not today. And one of the ways that cloud app security really helps is like Andy said, there's some built-in alerting based on malicious, known malicious OAuth apps, as well as just an overall evaluation of how common is the app and what is the level of permissions it's requesting. Because this goes all the way back to when we had Tanya Jenka on our show several weeks ago now, and she was talking about how applications should not request more privilege than they need, which we know, pr principle of least privilege. But it, it applies here again, where if you're a developer and you're developing a web app, if it's a good web app, it should request only what it needs. Andy, it sounds like that app you ran into the request for from the business analyst was probably not malicious intentionally. It was just uh, could have been coded better where the it was requesting only the permissions it needs. And you know, the challenge with users having privilege to approve these are they look a lot like the Android privilege prompts where it lists everything in one single box and you just hit accept once. It says, this app does this, 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 and this. And people go, yeah, sure, and click OK. And that's where you run into a challenge with this. And then it's really hard to detect when that data is actually being exfiltrated because, again, it's not going to set off any warning signs for you. So a great opportunity to, to review and address how those are configured today and, and hopefully clean out some cruft there and get it a little tighter. Before we go on into some of these other use cases, I do just want to mention licensing real quick. For MCAS Discovery, I had mentioned previously in, um, earlier on the show that you may own parts of this and you may not even know it. If you are an M365 E3 customer or EMS E3 customer, you own MCAS Discovery. And so you can just go right to Cloud App Security Portal and start discovering applications, hooking up your O365, you know, at least the native Microsoft integrations. 
if you own those licenses, you also own something called Azure Information Protection, or I think it's been rebranded as Microsoft Information Protection. And that's a really cool product too. We'll probably do a, a show just to do a deep dive on that later on. But if you own M365 E3 or e, EMS E3, you own both of those products and they integrate together. And so one of the things that MCAS can do in the next major category is protect information in the cloud. So any information that you have, you can hook MCAS and Azure Information Protection together and it can give you insight on what files are labeled, what files are being stored in different places, how it's being shared. So those are that's another use case, especially if you are a Microsoft customer, that you can gain some visibility into where your corporate data is stored in the cloud. Then based off of that, you can also enforce DLP compliance policies. So you can create a DLP policy to enforce something or even just give you an alert. Say, I'm going to share something outside of my environment. And it hooks into third-party solutions too, like for example, Drop and Bo Dropbox. If you hook those APIs into MCAS, if I do an external sharing outside of my domain, I can say encrypt that on the fly with AIP or I could revoke different permissions. I mean, there's a, a list of governance things that you can do, which is really, really neat to know that if I share it outside of my domain, I can automatically say, put it into read only mode so that that document can't be printed or it can't be screenshotted. This is honestly kind of what you're talking about, Andy, I'd say when customers of course ask for differentiators, this is a big one for the Microsoft solution because of the integration with Microsoft information protection, you get that ability to crawl data at rest in Microsoft and third-party clouds, apply sensitivity labels based upon the content of the file. And then you can even use the sensitivity label of the file as a trigger. So a couple of quick examples go crawl all of the data at rest in OneDrive and SharePoint and any file that contains a credit card number, as a really simple example, apply my confidential label to it. Okay, that's handy. On the other hand, you could do things like, if a file is shared externally outside my organization and it has a sensitivity label of confidential or higher, automatically remove the external sharing. And so that's an example where in the first one, we're applying a label as the result of a policy. And in the second one, we are using the label as a trigger for the policy. And we should take a step back here and, and talk about what enables all of that to be possible. And that is kind of the second architectural type we talked about. This is now moving into cloud to cloud connectivity. And Almost any CASB today is going to do this. It's probably the primary mode of operation where you establish a connection directly between your cloud access security broker and any applications you want to be managed and controlled with that CASB. And the way this is done is you sign in with your equivalent of global admin or whatever it is in that particular product, and then you grant API permissions to the to the CASB essentially. So you say, in the case of Microsoft Cloud App Security, I grant permission to MCAS to have full rewrite, read write access to my entire box instance or my entire Salesforce instance. And that's what enables it to have that visibility and control. Now, one thing I want to point out here when this comes up is that Sometimes people treat these connected apps like Pokemon and they got to catch them all. But there is a small list of enterprise grade SaaS applications that have really robust and really mature APIs that are capable of being queried on the frequency a CASB needs to be useful and are granular and detailed enough 
to allow the CASB to have control and visibility into those applications. So that list is not big of popular enterprise apps with mature, robust APIs. So if you go in and you're evaluating any CASB, it doesn't matter whom it is, this list is not going to be huge. It's going to be you know, several handfuls of applications. I know on the Microsoft side, it's like about 15. And the fact of the matter is, there really aren't that many more out there that are missing because they just don't exist. There aren't SaaS apps that have really mature APIs. And so that's why you're going to see that limitation there more than anything. And, and that's something to think about. And you know, when we get into our third kind of architectural model a little bit later for having visibility and control, we'll talk about that reverse proxy method. That is the methodology to get control and visibility over the rest of your SaaS apps. But did just want to kind of make that call out about API connectivity. That's really important to understand is you're just not going to see a huge list of this. And the reason why is really on the SaaS provider side. A lot of them just haven't written those really mature, robust APIs that a CASB needs in order to be functional. Another really cool use case in protecting your information in the cloud is that you can try to teach or enforce safe collaboration and data sharing practices. So one of the cool examples that I like to use is, let's say for example, a user is trying to send some information like a password in um, a, an instant message app like Microsoft Teams or Workplace by Facebook. You can use a CASB solution to block that message from being sent. So it, it sees the message as a password and then based on that policy, it says, okay, well, I'm gonna just go ahead and block that. And so that's that's another use case for a CASB. And then as Adam mentioned in the reverse proxy, MCAS has session control policies as well as this reverse proxy um, that can integrate with your IDP to protect all of your SaaS apps. So as you're connecting to them, you can reverse proxy that connection back to MCAS. And what I like about this is you can apply granular policies based on if it's a managed or unmanaged device. And that ties into our modern management conversation where if it's managed, great. We can allow a, a more robust access to our SaaS applications. If it's unmanaged, we can do a couple of things. We can say, if it's unmanaged, we'll just go ahead and block access to those applications. Or because of that integration with Azure Information Protection, we can do some cool things like go ahead and download something from your OneDrive or go ahead and download something from your box or go ahead and download an attachment from your email on an unmanaged machine. I'm at grandma's house. I need to access this app, this document. I'll go ahead and download it and access it through OWA. But because of MCAS and it knows that it's an unmanaged machine, it's not being managed by Intune, it's not hybrid Azure AD joined, AD joined, then I'm going to go ahead and encrypt that on the fly with Azure Information Protection and give it read-only rights, encrypt it. So that's a nice way of providing access to something kind of opening up access and saying, I will give you access to this, but in a limited fashion. So that's another really cool way to control your data using a CASB solution. One thing I like about everything you just talked about, Andy, is, is how you're implementing kind of adaptive risk controls. We hear that term a lot, adaptive. And it's a really good mindset to get into where we're evaluating the risk of something at a smaller level than previously possible. So in this case, we're evaluating the risk at a sign-in properties level. And this goes back into our conditional access discussion and our modern management discussion like you referenced, where we're using all of those signals to kind of make that decision. And that's where you can also get interesting with your cloud access security broker is if it has integration with an identity provider, you don't necessarily have to send all of the traffic through the CASB all of the time. And that is powerful because you might not need the same level of controls on every device. If it's a managed device, maybe you already have controls in other ways. You might already have endpoint DLP. You might already have 
other methodologies to ensure that data is protected and secured. So you don't need to do that enforcement at the web browser CASB level. You're doing it downstream. And you have the assurance that that's in place because you know the device is managed and healthy and blah, blah, blah. So it's just really important that that when we we do this, we're not just layering on more controls for the heck of layering on more controls. We're actually evaluating the risk. What are the risks and how do we mitigate them? And we're using the tools to mitigate the risks that are endemic to each access methodology. And that's where we get really, really interesting and really powerful when we're able to make those decisions based on all of those different factors. And so that's why I like what you're talking about there is, for example, I'm gonna allow you to still be productive, but I'm gonna take steps to mitigate the risks that are inherent with using grandma's iMac at Thanksgiving. And that's great. We're still enabling the business to be productive and get things done, but we're also protecting company assets. And that's, you know, Apologies for kind of being buzzwordy here, but that's win-win, right? Exactly. I don't know about other CASB solutions, but for MCAS, for sure, one of the things that I found that was really nice, and I, th I think this is a newer feature that, that has been introduced in the last year or so, is that there's a lot of identity protection built into MCAS. So it's not just a cloud app security broker it integrates with identity. And I don't mean just Azure Active Directory. One of the native identity providers that it does integrate with is Okta. And a lot of people use Okta. And what's really cool is Okta has that robust API that Adam was referring to. And so it has that API integration. You can basically transfer all your logs from Okta and it will do certain things like show you within MCAS based on the same policies that they would do for Azure identity, like impossible travel or infrequent country detection or um, locations that uh, suspicious sign-ins, things like that, those, those alerts will pop up. And you can, again, scope policies based on those particular um, those alerts that have come up or those triggers or those IP addresses or, or whatnot. So I like the integration with identity, which of course, you know, we always kind of say how identity is the new control plane, but MCAS has that natively built in, not only with just Azure Active Directory, but also with, with Okta. So that's really cool. You, you kind of make a little point there without even knowing it, Andy, is that, and again, I'm just speaking from my experience and what I know, but I'm trying to generalize it. Cloud access security brokers are interesting in that they have a foot in two different areas of practice when it comes to information security, because certainly there's plenty of use cases around information protection, but there's also many capabilities around threat protection. And they do a little bit of both. And that's interesting because usually products kind of line up in one area or another, like DLP products, that's all information protection. And uh, endpoint protection platforms, that's all threat protection. But CASBs are both. And that's what's interesting about them. And you mentioned all of those alerts around different identity types of, or types of identity compromise. And one thing that gets brought up, and so I'll just make this point here, is people will say, well, why are those alerts in Cloud App Security? I already get those in Azure AD. And to specifically answer that question, it's because there is not the assumption that you have federated all of your applications with Azure AD or your identity provider. They may have a separate identity entirely that users um, interact with in that application. And so correlation will happen. So you see the same alerts for the same identities, but there might be an anomalous login just in, say, Salesforce because you don't have Salesforce federated. Um, so you'll run into that from time to time. I know I worked at an organization that intentionally did not federate their Workday instance with identity because they wanted it to be a separate sign-in to protect against um, 
some kind of malicious behaviors that maybe were legitimate and maybe could have been addressed through tech. But anyhow, it was separate. And that way you're still going to want to know, hey, somebody signed into Workday with a, you know, an impossible travel kind of scenario or whatever. So that's why those are, are separated out. And then you'll also see in these products tend to be a lot of alerts around potential malicious behavior, whether that's suspicious inbox forwarding rules or mass download or um, unfamiliar admin behavior. You'll see all sorts of different things, whether it's behavioral analytics based or whether it's just more straight algorithmic based, like user has downloaded X amount of megabytes of data in X amount of minutes, and we're going to throw an alert on that. So there's probably more threat protection stuff I'm not thinking of, Andy, that you may want to elaborate on. Yeah, one of the boxes on the dashboard for MCAS specifically with all of this threat protection is they have a box of for users that you want to investigate. And they float that based on some sort of risk score that's calculated with all the data that's in MCAS. So that could be all those things that we've talked about. It could be that this user had a impossible travel and then they also downloaded a bunch of stuff from their OneDrive or their, it will also show if it's a privileged account, if it has admin permissions within your SaaS applications or uh, Azure AD. So if it's a global admin or something like that or an exchange admin, it'll show that it's an admin account. And then it will take all of those signals and then kind of float it up to the top based on a risk score. And it'll say, hey, these are the users that you probably want to investigate. It also does things like malware um, detection. So if you have OneDrive or another cloud storage provider like Dropbox or Box, it can detect based on the, the files that are in there and hashes if it's a malicious file and it'll show all those malware uh, files within MCAS. So it takes all that information says, hey, this user has a bunch of malware in their OneDrive. They have some risky behavior from sign-in. They're doing malicious uh, uploads. It, one of the apps that it integrates with is Workday as well, which I think is really cool. I haven't done this in our environment yet. It's on my list, but it'd be interesting to see the integration if it could see when an employee was onboarded and offboarded and maybe correlate between that. I know for... The compliance products with Microsoft, there's an insider risk um, product where it can correlate with Workday. And let's say your Workday feeds over like a termination or two-week notice or something like that, and then it sees that employee download a bunch of stuff from a cloud application, and maybe you want to investigate that. So I'd be interested to see if what kind of correlation there is there. But Workday does integrate natively as well with with an API with MCAS, so that's kind of cool. So the last category that we're going to just briefly touch on is the ability to assess and protect your IS environment. If you have infrastructure in the cloud, Google Cloud Platform, AWS, Azure, those all have native hooks into MCAS, which is, I don't know if other CASB solutions have this, but um, what MCAS can do is that it can audit those environments. It can audit the configuration and, for example, give you a security recommendations for, say, AWS. Are you configured correctly? Um, it can monitor activities. You can feed over, like, AWS CloudTrail or uh, other feeds from Azure, which I'm sure Adam can speak a little bit more on. But you can capture those user activities with those applications that are being hosted within your IaaS provider, you can protect against threats, um, different alerts, and all that feeds into MCAS as well. So um, those have native API connectors for those major cloud platforms like AWS and Cloud, uh, Google Cloud Provider, and then uh, of course it integrates with Azure. Yeah, this this is uh, something that doesn't get talked about enough, but I think is is very valuable, and it will give you and, and Andy gave a couple examples. I'll just give a couple more like in AWS, you have an S3 
uh, storage that is configured to allow world writable, which means anybody can upload stuff to it. Like that's bad, you might want to fix that. Or over in Azure, you have a virtual machine running that allows RDP access on its public IP <laughs> um, NIC. And you might not want to allow RDP from anyone on the public internet as, as examples like that. So it'll give you some coaching there on, on ways you can remediate some of those concerns. And that's very, very valuable, of course, in securing your IaaS and um, environments. Yeah, one of the Azure ones that floated up that I had remediated um, when I first rolled out MCAS, when I discovered this capability within within NCAS was we had a bunch of owners for an Azure subscription and it said, Hey, you should only have so many owners. And so that's not something that you normally go and check, right? You're usually aware of like the global admins and um, you know, the different like exchange admin and all those roles that are built in, but you don't think about your subscription because anyone with owner access to your subscription has a pretty broad, uh, access to all of your resources that are tied to that subscription and it inherits down to everything down there. So that was followed up as a, a recommendation to remediate. And so I thought that was pretty cool. So we've gone over a lot of use cases for an, for a CASB solution. And of course we dived more into Microsoft cloud app security, but this is definitely something that I could would recommend, you know, if you have a broad work from home employee base, you're using a lot of SaaS apps. This is a good way, even if you're just doing discovery. I think a lot of Casby solutions have some sort of tier where you can just do discovery. And at least, as Adam put it, table stakes. It's just discovering what application is being used. So you have a category, uh, a catalog and you can start from there and then maybe get a little bit deeper and granular into the policies. Yeah, discovery, one thing I always point out too is if you see shadow IT out there, let's let's put on our modern IT hat and instead of saying, this is bad, this is malicious, we need to shut this down, these horrible users, how dare they not use sanction tools? Let's take a second to understand that Usually, if people are using a unsanctioned tool, it's because either the sanctioned tool doesn't meet their needs or there isn't a sanctioned tool. So instead of just running to shut everything down, let's understand how we can enable users to get the work done in a, in a sanctioned fashion without cutting them off at the knees. And let's just make sure we adopt that approach as we evaluate our discovery reports, okay? Yeah, that's why I really love that position at our company called that technical business analyst because they, they essentially are embedded in the business. They're separate from IT and they, they report back the, the needs. And so hopefully the goal is to help the business find the tools either that we own or something that we need to acquire and uh, do it in a, in a way that IT can support it, security has had insight and, and we've approved it and then they go and purchase it, right? I'll also do a, a link in our show notes for um, MCAS Ninja training. It's a really cool um, training that you can go through and essentially learn about Microsoft Cloud App Security. If it is, if you are a Microsoft customer and you have MCAS as part of your licensing, uh, I definitely recommend it. So I'll put that link in our show notes. That's a great Anything call. Anything else out. you want to and add, Adam? Yeah, um, just just a couple of brief things. M make sure you're connecting all of the apps you're capable of connecting. You know, by default, that's not going to hurt anything. It's just going to give you alerting. So get that connection. Allow that data to flow across that API. It may take a couple days to build in anyway. So, you know, whatever CASB you're using, evaluate the list of what it supports from API connectivity and connect all the things. And then just make sure you understand the feature set here and use it to implement your company policy that's already in place, whether that's implementing data loss prevention or information protection policies. 
make sure you do that. And then also turn on all of the alerts that are possible. It's going to be noisy at first, but you have to understand how they trigger to then tune them later. And then there's certainly going to be an effort needed to tune the alerts down and make them useful to you. Maybe some things that are really scary at other companies you're not as concerned about, and that's fine. But you have to get those turned on and start seeing how noisy the alerts are to know how to tune them. And so that's a good place to start too. It's just in general, turn on all the things. Don't be, don't be shy with these tools because for the most part, they're alerting and monitoring tools. So you're not going to regret getting them turned on. What you're going to regret is not getting them turned on sooner. And then there's going to be the opportunity to dial it back and make it more useful after the fact. But get it get it fired up at first and then maybe one last thing is when you do start getting into building out policy that takes governance actions automatic response be really conscientious to how you build those out because you can definitely paint yourself in a corner or do something unintended if you don't really 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 vet what you're doing so take the time to do that start small and then let it expand over time because with great power comes great responsibility. Thanks, Spider-Man. Uh, and when you have the power to crawl all of your data at rest in a cloud service, that's a lot of data. Make sure you're you're handling it with kids' gloves. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or follow-up comments on the episode, please let us know. Our contact information will be in the show notes. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.